So like Tiffany said, um, I'm the new chiropractor here, and if any of you have ever been to a chiropractor before, I'm a little bit of a different chiropractor in the sense that um, the type of adjusting I do is low force, and my specialty is actually pediatrics and pregnancy. So I've worked with a lot of families, um, not only you know, you know, working to manage ADD and ADHD and other conditions on the spectrum, but just also any aches and pains that that children get, ear infections, reflux, cranial issues. So I have a little bit of a different perspective. I adjust everybody, but I get a little bit of a different perspective. So without further ado, we'll get started. Um, one thing I want to clarify on your notes, the title of the lecture, I, I kind of misnamed the title of the lecture because I said ways to treat ADD, ADHD without medication. And when you use the word treatment, especially with a condition like ADD or ADHD, it implies that we are treating that condition. When in reality, what I'm working with is I'm working with the brain and I'm working with the nervous system. And by doing that, we're correcting the underlying causes of all of the symptoms of ADD and ADHD. So really, when you diagnose you know, a condition like this, it's more you know, a group, a cluster of symptoms as opposed to there's not a, a diagnostic imaging test or a diagnostic lab test that will specifically tell you that you are on the spectrum. So I just want to clarify that before we get started also. And I also wanted to um, direct you to this book. This book is called Disconnected Kids. It's by a chiropractor named Dr. Robert Melilio. He's a functional neurologist. He's done a lot of research in this area. And um, functional neurology is, is the idea that the nervous system is plastic and it's changing and that there are a lot of things we can do to influence the nervous system and influence the brain. So it kind of sees the brain and the nervous system as a working entity that's greatly influenced by the environment. So what we're looking for are areas in the brain that are overworked or underworked. Um, again, DSM-4 defines ADHD as developmentally inappropriate levels of inattention and hyperactivity resulting in functional impairment in academic, family, and social settings. So this has implications in school, for families. You know, this is a, it's a pervasive condition in our society. Um, again, a few signs and symptoms. I'm not going to read them. You guys probably already know them. The only thing I do want to point out with this is if you look at the developmental profile of the signs and symptoms associated with ADHD, um, you know, squirming, fidgeting, interrupting. Um, I have a three-year-old daughter who displays these symptoms on a daily basis, but as a three-year-old, that's developmentally normal for her. So what we're looking at is, you know, kids who, who have these imbalances, there's a brain imbalance to where they never fully developed in the way that they were supposed to. So all of the, the genetics, the genetic code that codes for all the different connections within their brain, for some reason or another, was, was slowed down. So again, I just wanted to point that out. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with those. Um, and also, just to give us a framework for this, I wanted to give you just a few statistics. So again, the, the APA and the DSM diagnosis, or di has diagnosed 3 to 7% of school-aged children. Um, I've even seen studies where it's upward to 17%, so this figure might be a little bit conservative. Uh, 5.4 million children, boys much more likely than girls to have ever been diagnosed with ADHD. And the reason why boys, especially on the spectrum, the reason why boys are so much more significantly affected by this is boys' brains are much more sensitive prenatally to the mother's hormones. So if a mother is stressed out during her pregnancy, a boy's brain is going to be a lot more susceptible to that, to the higher levels of those stress hormones. So that's why, you know, stress, toxicity is a lot more detrimental to boys, as well as the first two years of life are mostly dedicated to building the right hemisphere. And a lot of kids who have these, who are on the spectrum, um, have a right hemisphere deficiency. So again, I, and I want to clarify too that these are not gross neurological defects. If you went to a neurologist, all of their neurological signs would check out fine. But if you take a more subtle look at some of these signs, you start to see where the nervous system is definitely affected in particular ways. Um, and oh, also, boys also have 40% less connections between the right and the left hemispheres. So where girls might be able to adapt a little bit better, boys are not able to adapt because they have just less connectivity, which is why we're smarter and we put pieces together better. You know, women are more intuitive. Some people might say that's because we have more connections in our brain. 
Again, framework cost of this, we have 2.7 million youth receiving medication. That's 20 million prescriptions for Ritalin per year and an average estimated cost of 36 to 52 billion dollars. That's a billion with a B. And I, I really want to emphasize with this that this is just ADHD. This does not include the entire spectrum of disorders because on the spectrum, you know, ADHD is actually more of on the milder end. You know, on the, on the more, you know, serious end we have autism and, um, and so, but that's a whole different ballgame. That is not included in these um, statistics. So some of the other conditions on the spectrum. This is just a list um, that I have divided up for your, just kind of for your own benefit. Um, so let's talk about the brain because the brain is the functional connection between all of these disorders. We can't pinpoint exactly one spot in the brain in these children that's affected. That's because it's the connectivity between the neurons. So there are a couple things I want to talk about specific to the anatomy. We're not going to get into a lot of neuroanatomy today, but one thing I want to point out is the brain and the nervous system is a two-way street. We typically view you know, the brain as the master controller of our bodies, which it is. It controls all of our movements, it controls all of our autonomic functioning, it controls everything. But what a lot of people discount is the role that stimulation and input into the brain plays. So every movement we make, every smell that we have, every sound that we hear, everything works to stimulate the brain. And if the brain isn't stimulated, if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. So if certain areas of the brain aren't stimulated, then there's a, there's a greater chance that they're going to start to atrophy. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that, again, what I've kind of talked about thus far, we have two hemispheres in our brain, our right and our left. And as, as, as species, as, as mammals, we've evolved to use our, our, the two hemispheres of our brain in different ways. So it allows us to have a lot higher cognitive functioning, but the price we pay for that is if there's any you know, dysfunction in, in one hemisphere, the other hemisphere can kind of maybe try and start to make up for it, but not in the same way that a lot of other mammals do. For instance, dolphins. Dolphins have kind of a mirror image side to side, and they actually only use one hemisphere at a time. And so they never actually have to sleep because they'll use their right, and then they'll sleep their right and use their left, and then vice versa. So because we have separate functions in each hemisphere, we don't have the ability to do that. So. Um, so it's important that we use you know, both hemispheres together and a lot of actions of both hemispheres work together in concert. So if one side is deficient, you know, the other side is going to feel the repercussions. So what tends to happen if one hemisphere is stronger than the other? This is what in functional neurology, functional, functional chiropractic neurology, we refer to as functional disconnection syndrome. And again, this is a term that was coined by Dr. Robert Malilio. And he's, again, written a lot of textbooks about this. And that book that I displayed in the beginning is a great, it's written for the public. It's very easy to read, very easy to understand. Um, but what he's, his, his theory and his premise is, and I'm just going to read this and then I'll explain it after I read it. But cognitive and motor functions are actually part of the same function, even though they have historically been viewed as separate. They both evolved in parallel as a product of the evolution of sophisticated complex movement. So the same underlying mechanisms that evolved to enable more complex coordinated movements were adapted and utilized to affect more sophisticated cognitive processes. So the theory being, you know, if you go back in, in, in Homo sapiens evolution, we started off as quadrupeds, meaning we were like apes. We share about 98, 99% of the genetics with them. So we started out on all fours. And what separated our species is when we got up on two legs and we became bipeds, then all of a sudden we started getting all of this new sensory information to the brain. So where before we were mostly looking at the ground, maybe we looked up a little bit to see what was going on. Most of our sensory integration from sight was the ground. And as far as proprioception, as far as kind of, you know, our bodies, we didn't have as much proprioception as when you stand upright. Now I have information coming from every single vertebrae in my spine. I have all this information coming from my hips, my knees, my feet. All this information has to be 
coordinated in the brain, and the brain had to kind of organize this, the complex movement. So I can, I can walk with my feet and move my arms in different ways. They're not necessarily tied together. So all of these complex movements are coordinated by the brain. But this was also the time that we were developing a higher cognitive function. So the theory being the motor function and the cognitive function are very much intertwined and very much connected. And so that's why with kids who are on the spectrum, you, you have a list of, you know, cognitive behavioral issues, but you also have a list of motor dysfunction. These kids tend to be very clumsy. They tend to be, they, they can't sense their bodies well in space. And so the two go hand in hand um, very well. And a great example of this is there is a phenomenon known as space dyslexia. Has anybody ever heard about this before? Um, yes, so this was the idea that when NASA started sending, you know, astronauts into zero gravity space, they didn't know exactly what effect that was going to have on their brain. They, they you know, postulated that their, their muscles would atrophy and they would become weaker, but if they didn't, you know, use those muscles, they never predicted the, the idea that the astronauts developed what was known as space dyslexia. So as they started moving less and moving their joints less, and they didn't have that constant input of gravity into their system on all of their joints, then they started having cognitive dysfunction and they started developing dyslexia. So again, that that's a great illustration of how the two are connected, but it's also a great illustration of how quickly the brain changes. Our brain is very plastic and it can atrophy just as quickly as it can build new connections between neurons. So that's neuroplasticity is a big is a you know big thing to keep in mind, you know, throughout the rest of this talk that our brains are constantly changing. Like they've done MRI studies where they've actually measured the amount of gray matter and in a matter of a couple of hours after learning a new task we have more gray matter, so more connections within our within our brain. So it's, it's our brains are very very susceptible to outside influence. So functional disconnect, people who cannot feel their own body movement cannot intuit the connections between movements and feelings and thoughts. So that's again just another summary. So uh, these are some of the some of the motor characteristics or some of the other characteristics. They tend to be, you know, clumsy, uncoordinated. Like I said, poor muscle tone. Uh, how many of us have ever had the experience of holding a child and they just kind of flop in our arms? You know, and I'm talking like an older baby. You know, maybe six months plus. They have what's known as hypotonia, where their muscles are globally weaker, and that is a very early sign that they are not developing correctly, that, they're, that they're, the neural connections are not developing correctly. And w one thing, I'll, uh, as a side note, this isn't on this side, but this is a side note. I was actually just listening to uh, a speaker who was speaking on this topic, and he was saying that 85% of our genetic code goes toward the, these connections in our brain. So when children are developing, those first couple years of life are extremely important. And, you know, the big question is what is disrupting the normal development in these children. And so that's one thing to keep in mind also as we as we move forward. So what causes, you know, functional disconnect syndrome? What's the smoking gun? We have not been able to isolate one thing. We have a lot of theories. Genetics is one theory, but genetics isn't a real viable theory because genetics would not account for the fact that we have had such an epidemic surge of these conditions. And, you know, a lot of people will say, well, they're just being diagnosed better. Well, that might account for, you know, 25% of the new cases, but these are increasing by a thousandfold, you know, within the past, you know, 15 to 20 years. So genetics is not a real viable option in the traditional sense. Um, toxicity, environmental toxicity is is a big factor and part of the reason that is such a factor, how many of us are familiar with the term epigenetics? Are you guys familiar with that? So basically epigenetics is kind of a new buzzword, it's a new term. There was a, a great Time article, I think it was last year, on this. Um, but it's basically the idea that you know, to, to change the structure of our genes takes thousands of years, but there are a lot of proteins that surround our genes that are responsible for the expression of our genes. And so, and those are extremely susceptible to environmental toxicity. So if our genes, our, our genetic code might still be intact, but if those genes aren't being expressed correctly, we're going to start to see issues. So, you know, again, the theory is a lot of these genes are staying turned off. And so, you know, 
when 85% of the genes in the human genome go to build the brain, if, if those genes are being turned off at crucial points due to the toxicity of the child or the mother, then you know, there's going to be a lot of functional issues down the road. So, but again, the hope is just as easily as they can be turned off, they can be turned back on again. So, so what's causing what's causing this? You know, if there is no smoking gun, and I have to preface this slide by saying a lot of this is my opinion. There's there's I, I, there's you know some studies to to back up some of these ideas, but a lot of this is kind of my opinion, my experience, and so take that with a grain of salt. Um, so we have a decrease in physical activity, which is leading to an epidemic rate of childhood obesity. There's a direct correlation between percent body fat and a decrease in physical exercise. So just like those astronauts that weren't moving their joints and they weren't getting you know, all that stimulation, children in their early years who are not outside playing, who are not allowed to run, to jump, to experience all the senses, are in the same way not feeding their nervous system and they're not stimulating the brain in the correct ways. So is it a coincidence that as obesity increases, so do these behavioral issues? It might be a coincidence, but there might be some common links there too. And just an interesting fact for you, the, the average high, school will, a high schooler will have spent 15 to 18,000 hours watching television and only 12,000 hours in school. So you can kind of start to see you know, where the discrepancies lie in our society. So TV and computer games are a big part of this. Sedentary lifestyle, kids are now sitting. Um, watching television, they've done you know, studies on the brain while people actually watch television, and there's a decrease in cortical functioning while you're watching TV. So in a sense, it kind of sends you into this comatose state while you're watching TV, which is great sometimes. Sometimes that's what you want, but not for children all of the time. Um, and posture. Posture is a huge thing, and as a chiropractor, I'm especially attuned to this. But I mean, if you imagine all the devices we have now, kids are on their phones like this, you know, they're playing video games like this, on the computer, on the phone, and that has, you know, staying in one posture for uh, an extended period of time can have an effect on brain. There are studies that link behavior with posture. So, so there, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of, you know, negative aspects to, you know, the TV and computer games, especially with how much they're used today. Um, stressful pregnancies and births. I, I highlighted this one again. That's my bias. I've worked with a lot of pregnant moms, worked with a lot of children, and um, we have an epidemic rate of women who are being medicated during birth, which birth has become a very surgical procedure. It's become a very medicated procedure, and any mom who thinks that those drugs that they're taking while they're in labor, that they're not affecting their child, are absolutely wrong. All of those drugs cross the placental barrier and they do influence the child in an extremely important time where that child is coming out of the birth canal. And so we have these, you know, moms who, who don't eat healthy during their pregnancies, um, who are having medicated births at the hospital, and then as soon as the child comes out, they're, they're getting pumped with antibiotics and vaccines. And so I'm not saying that one of these things is the issue, but when you look at kind of the big picture and you take a step back at everything we're doing, I mean, to me it's, it doesn't make sense that during the most crucial developmental period in a child's life, from age birth to two, that's when they get the most amount of vaccines. And so again, I'm not trying to say that's the issue because that's not, that is one piece of a much bigger issue. But again, that doesn't, in my mind, that doesn't make sense to me. So um, inadequate nutrition, I think the average is 8% of children get the daily recommended fruits and vegetables, so children are not eating healthy. And even the ones that are eating healthy, you know, the, there are pesticides on the food, there's, you know, all the processed food has preservatives in it. This is kind of a gross statistic, but I actually heard that, that morticians are now using 25% less embalming fluid in humans because we have so many preservatives already in our system. They don't need to. We, we, get, we get formaldehyde and, and we, you know, and diet sodas get, you know, all of the aspartame gets converted to formaldehyde. So kind of gross, but it is what it is. Um, so, uh, and then the, this last one, the infant apparatuses. This is something, this is, a, as a chiropractor, a, kind of a huge pet peeve of mine, and I'd be very careful when I educate my parents on this. But if you can imagine a child, 
you know, in today's society, children are, you know, they, they come out of the womb and they're put in a car seat. They're taken from the car seat and they're put in a swing. They're taken from a swing and they're put in the bouncy seat. They're taken from, you know, that bouncy, jumpy seat and they're put in an extra saucer. They're, they, so they just go from one apparatus to the other. And all of those decrease, you know, sensation. The child's not having that skin-on-skin -skin contact with the mom. They're being put in an upright position, which at most ages that these are introduced, kids don't have the postural ability to maintain that position. So there are a lot of repercussions for, you know, kind of messing with the child's development. I mean, I tell my moms the best thing is give the child a wooden spoon and let them lay on the floor, you know. And one of my favorite things are those jungle gyms where, you know, they have like the crisscross and there's stuff dangling so they can play with it. and and you know hold your baby as much as possible give them as much stimulation so to me it, there's there's you know the, these infant apparatuses drive me crazy <laughs> so okay so then again to give another framework let's why some of this stuff is so important let's talk about brain development in the infant so brain growth actually starts 40 days after conception so typically at this point a lot of moms don't even know they're pregnant yet so this is when you start you know the the cells start migrating to the certain areas that is that are going to make up the framework of the brain so neuron growth flourishes until the fifth month of pregnancy and and neurons can even you know come into existence at a rate of a quarter million cells per minute so it's it, there is a lot of growth you know happening during this time period um, the brain is the only organ not fully formed at birth. And part of the reason it, it isn't is the child wouldn't be able to fit out of the mother. And again, that was one of the one of the concessions we had to make for standing up on two legs is the child had to, you know, develop more outside of the womb. So that first year of life is really kind of an extended period in the womb because a lot of a lot of animals come out of the womb walking. So we have this first year of life. You can kind of think of it as an extension of the whole, you know, pregnancy period. Um, and so, uh, okay, so the, the neuron growth starts flourishing, and um, our, our our brains contain over a hundred billion nerve cells or neurons, and and trillions of support cells, the, the glia cells. And so, I mean, this, you know, we go through different periods of pruning where, you know, kids lose a lot of the neurons in their brain if they don't use them. So, again, that's where stimulation is extremely important. And while the child is in the womb, they're dependent upon the mother's body for nutrition and stimulation. So it is extremely important that moms, before they even try to start conceiving, are already healthy, they are you know, on a good diet plan, taking the correct vitamins. So, so, this, so again, one thing I want to emphasize with this is the idea of neuroplasticity. So growth of the brain that is, is done by all of the connections that are made by the cells. So we're born with the framework, and we're, we're kind of born with the blueprint, and so what happens as the child develops is we start connecting all of these, all of these neurons. So what is one indication of how we know we're developing correctly? Milestones. And pediatricians will tell you, oh, don't worry about milestones. As long as a child hits a milestone, don't worry about when they hit it. Well, that's, that's an incorrect premise because if you think of the brain, you know, if you think of like the, the blueprint of the brain, every, every uh, Every milestone that we have builds on the previous, and there's a very you know those those you know 85 percent of our genes that that control you know the connections in our brain. The reason we have so many is because the the brain and the body develop in a very particular order, and so if the brain if if the milestones are off, it's an indication that a child is developing mus muscular control, posture, all of those things in an incorrect format. So I, I've seen a lot of parents who are like, oh my kid walked early, they walked in nine months, they're amazing. And I tell them, kick their legs out, make them crawl, because crawling and walking are probably two of the most important and two of the most indicative of issues down the road, because that cross-crawling mechanism that kids have are, is extremely important in integrating the two hemispheres. But not only the cross-crawling motion, but when children are crawling, they're mostly looking down. As they've been doing it longer, they start to look up more and more, but they're mostly looking down, so they're not getting a lot of you know, sensory information from the rest of the world. They're solely focused on that cross-crawl motion and building those connections between the two hemispheres so that when, you know, they get 
comfortable with that, then it's very natural for them to stand up. And then that's why they're kind of uncoordinated and unbalanced when they first start walking because now they have to integrate not only all of their muscles, but then they also have to navigate this world. And I have a one-year-old and when he first started walking, you know, he was bumping into things and it's like they're like little bumper cars they don't you know they can only do one thing at a time they can only focus on you know walking and then and then once they get good at it then they start accommodating and they'll stop and then they'll kind of back up and then you know go the other way and so those two milestones are extremely important but but really all of them are important all of them build on the previous so a child when they first come out and they start lifting up their head it's important that they're developing you know the muscles that surround their spine especially in the neck so that they can do that well then they start rolling over and rolling over develops core strength and as their core strength starts to develop then that gives them the ability to sit up so each one builds on the last and if you skip a step you're skipping an important time period where they're integrating more and more information and so it almost kind of becomes like a one-legged race if one kind of falls behind but one side is kind of going at it, one hemisphere is going at a normal pace this side's going to get further and further and further behind because these connections you know continue to be made so that's kind of what we're working with going back finding out where the areas kids are deficient and rebuilding those pathways and so the timing again timing mechanisms are, are sensitive I, I tell parents don't worry so much about like if they walked exactly at 12 months, but did they crawl for two to three months before they started walking? So they could start walking at 14, 14 months, and that's fine as long as they crawled for a, no, you know, a number of months. So it's very, the timing is very sensitive, not necessarily you know, the actual month that they, that they start. And again, one thing I want to emphasize is every child is individual. So I don't ever want to make a broad assumption based on any of this information because, because that's what makes you know, these, these conditions so hard is that every child is different. Every child displays different symptoms. And so it's, you know, it's, it's hard to know exactly what's going on with each individual child. So we can't make broad assumptions based on this information. We can put all the puzzle pieces together and if a lot of them fit, then we kind of start to have a better picture. But don't just take one thing and be like, oh, my, my child is, 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 has a neurodevelopmental disorder because they didn't start walking until 14 months, because that may or may not be the case. And some kids learn to compensate. So we have an amazing you know, mechanism in our brain to compensate for deficiencies. So the five senses, I want to talk about the five senses, because the five senses are how the brain you know, receives information from the world. I, I, how many of us have had the experience of, you know, Christmas time, mom baking cookies and, you know, that, that smell of sugar cookies then becomes associated with Christmas with hopefully a feeling of well-being and good family spirit. And, and so we, we have a lot of our senses are what, you know, you know, attached to, you know, working memory. And so our senses are basically what build the stimulation within our brain. So our, our brain develop is, development is extremely dependent upon nutrition and stimulation by the five senses. Um, and again, intensity, frequency, frequency is extremely important, frequency and duration of, um, of these. So I always tell moms, stimulation to babies is, you know, in any way you can, you know, doing the skin on skin, talking to your child, you know, playing music. I, I mean, I have, my mom was very big about, you know, when I had my daughter, she was like, make sure you talk to her. And when my daughter was real, when she was an infant, my husband traveled a lot. And I remember calling my mom at one point and being like, mom, I'm talking to my child, but she won't talk back. And she was like, oh, honey, just wait till she gets to be nine or 10. She'll start talking back plenty for you. <laughs> So, um, okay, so then I, now I want to talk about the sixth sense. How many people are familiar with the idea of proprioception? Have you, has anybody heard of that term before? So proprioception is basically the idea that we know where our body is in space. So what I want you guys to do is I want you to stick your arms out in front of you and then go ahead and bend at your elbows and then go out and bend. Now I want you to close your eyes and keep doing that movement until I tell you to stop. So keep doing that. Now stop. Now keep your eyes closed. How many of you know where your arms are located in space? Are they bent or are they straight? Can you guys, you can tell? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So that's proprioception. Proprioception tells us where our body is in space. And so, so the definition, the ability to use muscle control and balance to resist gravity. And so this is the only sense that is active all the time because we're constantly influenced by gravity. So even just standing here, my brain is having, 
to integrate and coordinate all of the muscles so that I stay upright. It's sensing how much weight, how much pressure is being put on each of the joints, which muscles are stretching so they know which muscles should relax. So, so proprioception is extremely important, if not one of the most important senses we have for brain stimulation. And, you know, proprioception, you know, in these kids tends to be off, which is another reason why they tend to be clumsy and unbalanced and, you know, they, they, they have a hard time feeling where their body is in space. So again, they have that functional disconnect where they can't connect the cognitive with the motor. So um, as far as sensory processing, there are a couple different levels that we process <laughs> our world. At the very basic primary level, we, excuse me, we are at a basic level of arousal. So somebody who's in a coma is, does not have a primary means of sensory processing. They are not processing their world. Um, at a secondary level, most, most animals, most mammals are at a secondary level where they are able to process what their, their senses are, you know, are sensing and then they're able to make a, um, a decision based on that. So, you know, you can make, and it, most of it is kind of, you know, lower cognitive, you make a basic instinctual decision. Where humans are unique is we have a tertiary level of processing where we use higher cortical levels to process information. So a good example of this is if I, if I walked into this room and there was a, a big piece of chocolate cake sitting in front of me, you know, primarily I can sense it. I can probably smell it. I can see it. I might start salivating. My body starts responding to it. But then at a secondary level, you know, my brain is thinking, I could use that cake for the glucose. Glucose feeds the brain. I need to eat that cake. Well then, as a human, my tertiary processing starts kicking in and I start thinking, oh no, that piece of cake has 536 calories, 22 and a half grams of fat, I'm going to have to go to the gym for an hour and a half to work that piece of cake off, maybe I shouldn't eat that piece of cake. So where a lot of these kids get stuck is in that kind of secondary level. They just respond on a basic biological level and not, they're not able, you know, the, the higher centers of learning, the prefrontal cortex that helps a, has, you know, you know, integrate this information are not, you know, connected properly. So they're, they're kind of responding on a more basic instinctual level. So what happens if we cannot sense our environment? Again, the brain cannot synchronize its timing mechanisms, and the two hemispheres aren't working as a whole. So what happens if both sides don't work together, and then also what is if one is weaker than the other? So now we're going to look at both hemispheres and kind of what each hemisphere controls so we can get a better idea of what this picture looks like. So the right brain. Right brain is the big picture view of the world. This is we see the forest instead of the individual trees. This is the right brain is responsible for nonverbal communication. So if somebody were to go, ha, ah, we can tell if they're excited, we can tell if they're upset at us. A lot of these kids can't do that because they have a deficiency in the right brain. So and nonverbal communication provides the foundation for verbal communication down the road. Um, Again, right hemisphere is in charge of large muscle control, which is why they tend to be awkward. That hypotonia is a result of a deficiency in the right brain. The right brain gives us our emotional. It's, it gives us the ability to empathize with people. Um, math reasoning, so this is higher con conceptual reasoning. You know, word problems, um, you know, understanding the comprehension of not just being able to read a sentence, but to understand the meaning behind that. Um, interpreting information, unconscious actions, negative emotions. So a lot of the negative emotions of fear, disgust, you know, kind of that are, are protective for us. You know, we should have these reactions in certain circumstances are absent if there's a right brain deficiency. Again, right brain responds to low frequency sounds, high frequency light. So it responds very well to the darker, deep hued colors, blues, purples. Um, it responds well to harmony, interval, and quality. Um, Understanding abstract concepts, again, that goes back to the math and word problems. Um, it's very cautious and stay safe, so our right brain is the one that tells us, whoa, 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 stop, wait a second, you know, maybe we should evaluate the situation before we proceed. Um, it likes newness and novelty, which is why a lot of kids who are autistic like a very regimented routine. They don't, they can't comprehend newness or novelty. They don't have that cognitive ability. Um, it gives us spatial awareness, and a lot of our proprioception is housed in the right hemisphere. Um, taste and smell, social skills, and digestion. Um, and then one thing I also want to hit on is immunity. 
So again, the, the two hemispheres kind of work together. So where the right hemisphere will dampen our immune system, the left hemisphere will will increase our immune response. So if, if, if both hemispheres are working, it's, it's a great situation. When we get sick, the, the left hemisphere says go, and then when we're not sick, the right hemisphere says stop. So, you know, what, what kids tend to look like, they tend to have a lot of food sensitivities because if the immune system is always go, 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 it's going to respond to every little thing that it encounters. So the kids with a right hemisphere C tend to have a lot of allergies. They tend to have a lot of autoimmune conditions. Um, the right hemisphere also controls not only digestion, but it also controls the pacemaker of our heart. So a lot of these kids early on get diagnosed with arrhythmias or a heart murmur and the pediatrician tells them, oh, you'll grow out of it. But that's really, you know, again, a difference you know, in their hemisphericity. So right brain are typically diagnosed as these, which is again a lot on the spectrum. A lot of on the spectrum are, not always, but a lot on the spectrum are typically diagnosed as a right hemisphericity. So then let's take a look at the left brain. The left brain tends to be kind of the smaller, more detail-oriented um, part of our brain. It sees the trees instead of the entire forest, and it kind of sees the world as a, a lot of stills, put, you know, it doesn't quite put all of the pictures together to make a movie, but it sees all of the individual stills. And it's very logical and it's very linear and, and so it, it's, it's very, the left brain is very good at verbal communication, they can express themselves well. Um, small muscle control, kids who tend to have a left hemisphericity tend to have really poor handwriting, that's kind of one of the first signs. Um, the left brain processes a lot of information and it's associated with positive emotions. So, you know, happiness, um, a feeling of well-being, you know, uh, people who have a low, you know, a, a low decreased left brain tend to be more depressed, um, they have less motivation and whatnot. Again, the left brain responds to high frequency sound, low frequency light, so it likes the reds, the oranges, the yellows. Um, it's very attuned to pitch and timing, rhythm, lyrics, and familiar sound. Um, again, very linear, very logical. It's very curious and impulsive, um, and it likes routine. It likes to know what to expect, and again, like I mentioned before, it activates um, immunity. So people who are very high left brain are very good at patterns, very good at sequencing and calculating, and they're very good at kind of approach behaviors. They want to see what's going on in a situation, and they want to dissect it, and they want to piece it all together and kind of come up with a pattern. So, so again, you know, the, the two, you know, work together. A lot of these are kind of opposite. They, they balance each other out. And one thing that's interesting is a lot of times we associate, you know, right brain with kind of the creative, more artistic side in people. But a lot of famous painters were actually more left brain, or at least, you know, that's what is suggested. And the reason being is, is you can be very artistic and be a left brain because you are, you're able to see something and exactly replicate it. You're able to see the patterns and the shadows and do a very good representation of that. Whereas, you know, right hemisphericity people tend to, who have a higher right hemisphere, tend to be very good at abstract art where they can kind of come up with stuff and very, be very creative. Um, Left brain deficiencies are typically diagnosed as these. These don't tend to appear until children hit school age, so they're not quite as, um, as apparent earlier on. And, and one thing I will notice too, or I will uh, notice, make notice of is kids who have a right hemisphericity, so a weakness in their right hemisphere, typically excel in elementary school. The telltale sign is when they hit middle school and they start having problems. That's because early, early grades, you know, it's a lot of rote memorization, it's a lot of calculating skills, it's a lot of they can, you know, read words very well and typically they're early readers. But when they start getting into like fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, it, the, the teachers are now requiring a higher level of understanding. And so they're now not able to kind of integrate that information, and so they kind of start shutting off. And they're not able to kind of process it. So they just kind of, you know, give up. And so then you start seeing attention issues. So that's one thing to be attuned to is if kids start having problems in middle school, that's a, it's a very good sign that there might be something going on with their right hemisphere. So now the million dollar question, how do we start reintegrating and reconnecting the areas that are deficient in the brain? And unfortunately, there's not a quick, easy fix. There's not, you know, a pill that you can take or something, you know, that you can easily do to, re to recorrect this. 
a lot of it takes time. Again, it's frequency, it's intensity, it's duration. It's doing things over and over again that stimulate the correct areas of the brain. So what I do with kids is I do a full neuro evaluation. We find specifically in that child the areas that are weak and then we design exercises specifically for their weaknesses. So again, that falls under these the functional exercises. You know, what do you do if you have a weak muscle? You go to the gym and you work it out. And it's the kind of the same thing with the brain. You know, we're working out the areas that are weaker in the brain. Sensory stimulation. So sensory as, you know, hopefully I've outlined and beaten to death, you know, that sensory stimulation is extremely important. Um, one example of this, does, does anybody have kind of a favorite smell? Like if you had like a candle, like for me, like one of my favorite smells is cinnamon. I always buy cinnamon candles, stuff that's very, very strong. I love coffee, love the smell of coffee. I can almost get a buzz off just the smell of coffee. And um, that's because the right hemisphere, I've diagnosed myself with the right hemisphericity, um, the right hemisphere responds very well to strong smells. So kind of the more floral sweet smells tend to make me more nauseous or, you know, so we've, I'm sure we've had the experience of smelling somebody's perfume and it's a certain type of smell that just kind of hits us the wrong way. That's because, you know, sensory integration is extremely important in, you know, and how the brain interprets it. Um, Chiropractic care. You know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention chiropractic care. Chiropractic care is extremely important, especially with these kids. I, I think with all kids, all kids should get checked, and all kids, you know, should you know be checked on a regular basis, um, because 90% of all sensory information comes from the joints in your spine. So if you have even a minor misalignment in the spine. The brain senses that, and over time, you know, our brain adapts to that malposition. And if it's not corrected, the brain's going to think that that's the normal position for that area of the spine. So, regular, gentle, specific, I highlight specific chiropractic care can be extremely beneficial for kids, especially during these first, you know, early years, because children will develop 90% of all of the connections between their right and their left hemisphere within the first six years of life. So that's before they've even started school. 90% of the connections are made. So it's an extremely important time to get children checked and, you know, it's, it's most kids love it. Um, so, and again, posture, you know, keeping track of your posture. Posture is kind of like breathing. We can voluntarily control. Like I can stand up straight, keep my shoulders back, keep my head back, but give me long enough and if I stop thinking about it, our tendency as humans is to kind of start to roll forward, slouch our head forward, and we kind of walk around like this, which is why when we get older we end up like this. And so posture is extremely important and it's very hard to maintain a good posture if your spine is out of alignment. So Again, chiropractic care is very important for that. Um, food choices and food sensitivities. Um, you are what you eat, and again, we've kind of already talked about this. One thing I will mention with this, with, with kids with these disorders, they very often have a lot of food sensitivities. And again, a lot of that has to do with the imbalance in their brain. But while we're starting, while, when we start them on the program, part of the program is to, to test and take out a lot of the foods that they're sensitive to. Because if they're constantly eating foods they're sensitive to, and they're constantly, you know, that, that immune system is being constantly stimulated by that, that left brain, then they're going to have this chronic inflammation and it's going to just take a lot longer. It's kind of like two steps forward, three steps back. It just takes a lot longer. So a lot of these kids unfortunately have to go on special diets. There are a lot of things they're very sensitive to. So um, neurotransmitter production, 80% of all neurotransmitters are produced in the gut. So your digestive health is extremely important for even your brain health. And sometimes your digestive system is even called your second brain. Um, and then breakdown of food. To be able to adequately pull all the nutrients out of food, we have to be able to break it down. And to do that, we need a healthily functioning digestive system. Um, supplements, I've just listed a few supplements, you know, antioxidants, B vitamins, fish oils, extremely important. You know, 60% uh, of our brain is made up of fat, so, you know, to fish oil is, is very important for these kids. And um, even dosing it higher than what the kids' supplements typically, you know, outline for these kids is, is usually the protocol because they need a lot more. Digestive enzymes, again, help, you know, them process their food. So as we're closing up, I'll take questions, but just a couple things to remember. There is hope for these kids. Don't give up on them. There is, it, it does take time. It takes a lot of effort, but a little bit of effort and a, and a lot of time now will help them exponentially down the road because reconnecting these areas of the brain that are weaker are going to set them up for, you know, a lifetime
of you know normal processing and learning. So um, again, small changes make a huge difference. Even the little things that we do, you know, make a big difference. So thank you. And I know I talked fast. I tried to fit it all in. Questions? Yes. Sure, PDD is typically, typically they diagnose kids who are younger with PDD. It's kind of a catch-all for, you know, they don't, they can't necessarily diagnose them autistic, but it's kind of a broader diagnosis. So it, it, it tends to, you know, so, so, so if they can't necessarily get, a, you know, a diagnosis of autism, if they don't necessarily fall into those, into that category, then, um, then it, it, they, they kind of fall under the umbrella of PDD. Again, the question, sorry, the question was, uh, what is PDD? So it's, very it's, a lot, it's a lot more general, more of a general diagnosis, but it's kind of on the track of autism. Yeah. Again, it's all criteria. That, that's how these are diagnosed. There are certain criteria and certain symptoms, and when they meet certain criteria, then they get a certain diagnosis. So, sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've read that ADD and ADHD is not just for children. If you are diagnosed with it, if you have it as a child, then instead of people thinking that's just a crazy wild kid, they mm -hmm. grow into ADHD adults. Mm -hmm. And it looks very different in adults. I mean, it it can be the same, but what what tends to happen is if kids aren't treated as a child, that hemisphericity is still there, and those connections were never made. And so it sets them up for, you know, even greater issues down the road, that they would never connect back to ADD or ADHD, but the, the, the connection is the brain. I mean, I've seen a lot of patients with a wide variety of issues that seemingly totally unrelated to ADHD, but I started going back in their history and it was like, well, did you have problems in school? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, I did. Did you have a traumatic birth? Oh, yeah, yeah, I did. It was a C-section and, you know, it was hugely traumatic for my mom. And so, so it does. It, these, the problems don't go away. Maybe some of the symptoms go away or maybe even they learn to cope better with the symptoms than they, they can as a child but it's still there and it still sets people up for issues down the road. Like, like adults, one, one, a good example of, of adults with hemispheristes, they tend to have autoimmune conditions. So people who have rheumatoid arthritis or um, lupus or any of the number of you know, autoimmune conditions where basically the immune system attacks the body, you can trace that back to they have, again, a right hemisphericity. And so they wouldn't necessarily connect that with the issues the child had in school or they had it as a child in school, but the two are very much connected because the brain is the root cause of what's going on. Yeah? Um, when you were talking about a traumatic birth, mm -hmm. C-section, you know, mm -hmm. this C-section has been planned around the obstetrician's schedule, and everybody knows when to expect the baby, like next week, when to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, again, step off my soapbox, and I'll, and I'll answer this again from an unbiased perspective or attempt to, but the, the, the process of the child coming out of the vaginal canal is extremely important in the sense that that little child's head gets squeezed as it comes out, and that initiates a lot of reflexes with cerebral spinal fluid flow within, you know, the nervous system, and, and I mean, even the process of the child, you know, the, typically when they plan C-sections, the moms never go, go into labor. So they never have, they release oxytocin, you know, and that's what initiates contractions. And, but that's also the hormone that binds the mom to the child. So there's that, that maternal bond and that maternal instinct. So if oxytocin is never released, you know, there is, again, remains a little bit, in theory, a disconnect between the mom and the child. It's traumatic for the mom. The mom can't hold the child very much, typically for the first couple of weeks after, because she can't carry heavy weight. Um, so you have issues with that. You know, again, the medication that the child's under makes it very hard for them to nurse right after they're, they're born. And so again, they have problems latching, nursing, and then they end up being bottled and formula fed. So it's kind of a, it begins a cascade of issues. And uh, almost always the kids I see with cranial issues, they were C-section births. So, again, there's, there's, there's a lot of connection, and it's, it's hard in people's minds to make the connections between these things, but they are all related, and everything that we do, especially early on, has a profound influence on that child's, you know, nervous system. So, 
again, yeah, centuries you know, it's it, centuries ago. You know, it, it's, again, you know, there's no, there hasn't been a study that has directly correlated any of these things, but to me it's just very curious how we've, you know, a lot of these things that have come into light within at least the past 10 to 20 years and then how they coincide with the issues that we have now with kids. And it's extremely pervasive. One in 86 now is the autism rate. One in 20 for sensory processing disorder. Thank you.